Welcome, everyone, to the Witness Underground podcast. Today, I'm with my co-host, Ryan Sutter. I'm Scott Homan, and today we have Danielle Martin as a guest. She runs a podcast called Failure to Thriving, and she has so far featured many people from inside the Witness Underground film and soundtrack, people that are on the soundtrack, as well as she's very connected to the Nuclear Gopher community and the Witness Underground project. Um, Thanks for coming on the show, Danielle. Sure. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm good. Real good. How's everyone there? <laughs> I'm good. I'm real good. Because you're in the Nuclear Gopher studio right now, right? Right, Ryan? Yeah, this <laughs> is uh, this is the Nuclear Gopher's current incarnation. So, do you like my I'm new in... choice of the gold side for the backdrop? Because of the blue side's over there, and this is the gold side. It's nice. It's very nice. It feels very homey. There's a <laughs> kitchen in the it, it, back there, too, so... Um, if I need to stop and go grab some tea, you know, don't, don't judge me. <laughs> I am in Playa del Carmen, Mexico, and I would love to show that, but I'm showing a wall and a plant instead, but there's like, I'm in like a penthouse overlooking the ocean right now. And today's <laughs> the first day of sun in like six days. So I oh. guess I could disrupt it. Yeah, that's okay. You can imagine yeah. a beach. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm in and beach, Danielle, though. where are you joining us from? Yeah. I'm in Los Angeles, California, in my oh, yeah. How's the hurricane? <laughs> it was it was fine. <laughs> it was just already like over. a a heavy day of rain. Yeah, it was like a week ago. Um, okay. It was basically just really rainy all day and like some heavy rain. So like for Los Angeles, that was very you know, but to me it just seemed like a real rainy day. But I did stay inside because I didn't know how bad it was going to be, and also I just didn't trust. Uh, people who don't drive in inclement weather, like on the you roads, the right you know. Choice. So I didn't know if I'd probably get hit or something because people don't know how to drive like in stuff here. So, but we also had an earthquake that day and it was my very first earthquake I've ever been in. <laughs> so how was it? What did you experience? Kind of exciting. <laughs> um, I don't know if I felt it or saw it more. I definitely saw it, but I don't know if like... So I was actually using the bathroom <laughs> so I was like on the toilet <laughs> and um, there was this shelf in front of me and it just started like swaying Whoa. and immediately Whoa. like I thought that something was wrong with me. Like I was like, am I okay? Like I thought I was going to pass out or something <laughs> immediately. Whoa. I'm like, what's wrong with me? And then my phone went off with like a alert and said earthquake detected, like get, you know, hold grab on get under something i don't know what it said but and then i realized i have no idea what to do in an earthquake but <laughs> you just I hold, hold on i would just hold on to the toilet in that scenario yeah that's that's what my <laughs> basically my what i did yeah tendency to Go do for the ride yeah, <laughs> just yeah. Like, i had this sort of like hole. To, like chris farley and tommy boy like in the in the airplane <laughs> you know kind of situation where he just like falls out with his pants that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> which I actually had that experience in an airplane once, which is very scary, and I thought the same thing. So this is my favorite had- podcast intro. <laughs> <laughs> Just Getting me telling know. embarrassing stories about myself. She's <laughs> yeah. an amazing podcast show host. I promise. I have been uh, as well. had the pleasure of being a guest on on your podcast, and you do get some really funny honest oh, so things sorry. that come out during the conversations Perfect. and yeah. often they're from you <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> i've known you for well, like 25 yeah. years and i was still laughing out loud in my car about when you started talking about the werewolf porn addiction i was like <laughs> this is... i forgot about that <laughs> <laughs> So I good. just started a new so one good. last night too. <laughs> yeah, the werewolf porn. Or werewolf. Yeah, I don't know what it is Sorry. about it, about it, but it's soothing. <laughs> <laughs> There's just like lots of drama, but like literally no stakes. I'm I'm not upset about any of it. So, do you get drawn to like fall? Do you fall for the characters? Like, do you love the um, werewolf or the victims of the werewolf? Not really. Like, uh, <laughs> it's just not the. Like, it's not you look super offended great. by the like, question. <laughs> I was just trying to think. Well, the thing is, is it's not super well written. Like, I think a lot of it's like self-published kind of stuff or like, you know, some of it feels like it's AI even because 
or just definitely not. Ed- There's no editor involved <laughs> for sure, because <laughs> sometimes they'll say something when they'll say something like almost the same thing in, in like a couple paragraphs. And then I get really upset because there's just like the from like lack of continuity <laughs> in characters. They'll say so something about, about somebody, and I'm like, <laughs> no, because this, like, you know. <laughs> You're upset that that was not what the character is supposed to do here. <laughs> yeah, no, like, yeah, it'll just like be something totally like they'll say one thing about the person, and then they're doing something, and I'm like, okay, I think it's almost like there's multiple writers or something, and then there's nobody mm-hmm. in charge like pulling it all together. But you know. <laughs> But thanks to thanks to your podcast, thanks to Failure to Thriving, there has been like a forty percent uptick in the sales of werewolf porn novels on uh, Kindle. <laughs> sure, and that's. I mean, that's the Danielle bump. Everybody wants Am the I Danielle an bump. That's the Danielle bump. <laughs> <laughs> and now, thanks to this podcast. It's going to be, it's going to go up 41%. Nice. Great. So I noticed in all of your guests that there was a striking um, similarity to the people I have been working with. Um, Yes. (laughs) And I was curious, uh, is, was that intentional? Or is that just because I've been like trying to make a story about your entire friend group for the last half decade? Um, It was kind (laughs) of, yeah, like. It just was all like my best friends were in that movie. And so, and like involved in that movie somehow. And so that's kind of how it ended up. It was the people that I'm closest to. And especially because um, I was just starting the podcast off and I had never interviewed anybody before. I wanted to definitely start with people that I was comfortable with because I was scared, you know, to do it. I mean, my first episode was Cindy and we've been friends for over 25 years, like super close friends. And I was, I was nervous for sure. Like starting it, it, you know, she was my first one. Yeah. Like once we got going, like it was so long, like that's, that was my first two episode one because I just looked down and we'd been talking for three hours just because it's, it's easy to talk. And that's kind of my, my favorite part of it. I try to not have them be too structured, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to have it be pretty open. I definitely have like a set of questions that I want to eventually get to, or at least one in particular, but, um, yeah, it's usually just kind of trying to get to know that person a little bit better, even if I already know them and, and like keeping in mind that I want my listeners to get to know this person too. So I'll ask questions maybe that I already know the answer to for these people that I know really well, but Mm -hmm. I had my first, um, interview right before it was my, my latest, um, guest episode was Matt Lateral. And I knew of him and we had met before, but I didn't really know him personally. So okay. that one was super fun and we had a really great time. And I was a little bit more nervous for that one because I was like, I feel like I know him because of his online presence, but I don't actually know him. Yeah. Um, I was so actually going to ask you that. I was going to ask you that because of the Matt Lateral episode. Um, he's also somebody who I don't really know, but I know of and I like his work and, you know, mm-hmm. in his is he's incredibly talented. When I saw he was going to be on your show, I was like, oh, oh. Cool. Yeah. But um, yeah. is it harder for you uh, interviewing somebody who like you know of more than know of, you know, cause you get in these deep conversations with like dear old friends um, mm-hmm. and uh, it's gotta be a totally different thing. Yeah. It felt different, but it felt like really good cause he's so nice and he's pretty open about things. Um, we we talked for a while when he got to my house um my cousin was making um food for us <laughs> so we talked because i didn't want to eat be eating and talking so on like recording so we talked for a while and then we recorded and then we went out for a drink and talked and it was like we'd been i don't know maybe it's because i knew knew about him but it's probably a lot of it was because of who he is he was very open and just really nice so I was nervous at first, but I quickly calmed down just because I, our conversation ended up being really easy. I do think it's a little bit harder when the person's more nervous and a little bit more reserved. Um, Cause I've yeah. definitely dealt with that a little bit with a couple of my friends that were just like a little bit more, more shy when it came to it and didn't um, want to elaborate as much as some people do. Like some people I have, I have to like kind of pull them back because they elaborate a lot (laughs) and then um, other ones just don't want to elaborate at all. So that gives me a little bit more pressure, which is good because I want to, you know, learn how to do that. 
because it's all it's all a learning experience for me because I had never done that before. I found I did a similar thing with my project, which is I, I well, working with the nuclear gopher community, specifically Eric and Cindy and Chad, I knew them since we were in our early 20s. We weren't super close, maybe Eric more than anyone else. And uh, I was like, I could interview this list of like 40 people I had compiled that could be a part of the documentary series or the interviews. And I was like, I think I need to trust my gut and go with people I tr- that I like, I know because this is a really heavy topic and a personal topic. Mm-hmm. And I, I was going straight for the Jehovah's Witnesses um, topic. Mm-hmm. And, but I also wanted the music angle because that was important to me to like help tell the story in an interesting and right. in, entertaining and humanizing way. But it, I, I think I made the same choice possibly out of fear or just like, I don't know who to trust or who yeah. will trust me. Like why would they mm-hmm. trust me as an interviewer? I don't really have much experience here. Yeah. Cause You're it's like, pretty, you know, bold, yeah. I'm asking vulnerable questions. For sure. And that's, I think the biggest um, part of mine is that I, I was very nervous to do it because it's embarrassing. Like I tell, I, I'm pretty vulnerable. Like I t- talk a lot about things that I've been through and um, I, I guess that that's what I wanted. Cause out of anything that I can offer for myself, I feel like that's the most that I can offer is to be like really genuine and authentic and, and vulnerable so that, and like the, the best compliments that I've gotten from people are when I talked about something and they were like, I know exactly what you were feeling or talking about that. It, it felt like you were talking to me and like, I've gotten a couple of those compliments and it's just the best. Cause that's, I mean, I guess that's what my, like my main goal was of here. And so you do have to find somebody that's willing to give into that for it to be like really good too. Cause they have to do that, but they also have to trust you that you won't take them somewhere that they don't feel safe to, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of podcasts that you're sort of talking to the audience, mm-hmm. you're talking to an audience and that's the goal. And you're both on, on board with that. But I feel like your show is more, you two are having a conversation and you're getting into, yeah, just getting deeper and more, it feels really personal and intimate. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And I understand that some people just aren't uh, into that, especially, you know, talking about themselves that way, because it is scary. <laughs> it's very scary to just have that but out you, there. You make it a lot less scary. I mean, and I I, yeah. I, I think in in person in general, you are very good at helping people feel comfortable and helping people want to be open, um, which is a, a really good great skill. I mean, I, I'm just, I, I've, I've, I've known that about you for a long time, but it's also why when I heard you were going to do a podcast, it was like, that tracks, like, <laughs> like that tracks. Like I could see people wanting to talk to Danny because everybody wants to talk to Danny. So huh. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. But I mean, I like that you're using that. Are you finding, um, now that you're out in LA, are you like, having a new list pop up of people you want to bring in or are you still kind of, uh, how's that going? How's that affecting the any... podcast? Yeah. Um, so the, like my last one was a solo. So normally this week would be a guest one, but I don't have anybody recorded. So it's just going to be another solo one. So I don't have anybody yet. I have talked to a couple people and they, I've like mentioned it, mentioned it to them. And they were like, yeah, like maybe some, you know, so I don't have anybody uh, set yet because I just don't know a ton of people out here yet. I know a lot of people, if you'd like to connections, what kind of people are you looking for at this point now that you're more opened up and you're Mm -hmm. getting legs under your podcast with new strangers? Honestly, like I like talking to people that, I mean, I've talked to so far, like people in tech, people in um, Mindy's a librarian. Like I've, I'm trying to think of, I'm totally blanking on everybody else I've talked to, but like, I don't, it doesn't really matter um, as far as like what industry they're in or anything like that. I just want them to be somebody that's interesting to talk to, that has a story to tell about themselves or is just open to me getting to know them more and just being like giving a little bit of vulnerability up to, to be on it. And that's really all I want. I just, um, I'm not really... I don't know. <laughs> I guess I don't know. No, I'm, pretty, I'm very open. Yeah. yeah. It seems really broad. Like a lot of humans could qualify. 
Yeah, yeah. Because I think I I just find people fascinating. I think people who don't even feel like they're fascinating people really are. And so mm-hmm. I don't need I somebody that means. seems super impressive either. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I like talking mm-hmm. to everybody. There's this group of people out there that I met through the film festival world, especially um, in Genre Blast in Virginia. But they were they live in L.A. And so they became like amazing community of filmmakers I met in L.A. And I was really trying. I mean, the pandemic was a hard time to meet people making films because most of them left to go to Georgia during the pandemic or mm-hmm. somewhere else because there's no industry. Um, so it took a, it took till like the last not a year or so. Um, but they're they're like making horror films. They're crowdfunding their content. They're super helpful. They work on each other's stuff like pro bono, like freebies for each other's thing. Um, just going after it, and they're super humble and chill. I'd love to connect with that community because they're like my favorite in the that are like in the industry. Like Very they're really cool. relatable. Yeah. And yeah. I have a couple of documentary filmmakers that friends that I like, I met also on the run film festival run for witness underground and mm-hmm. like they're super chill and like hang out and get brunch and like go to see Marilyn Monroe's grave, hang out for the afternoon. And we <laughs> nice. go to the jo- we went to the Joan Didion museum, like on a whim one day, like cool. Oh, fun. Let's go. go read yeah. papers that someone wrote in the 1960s. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really cool. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm open to meeting people. I mean, part of the reason I came out here was to just be open to new opportunities and try, just try new things out. I'm still not working. I have to find a job ASAP, but it's been a little bit harder than I thought, but Mm. I've been keeping busy. I mean, I'm definitely not one of those people that needs to work. Like, (laughs) I mean, (laughs) I take that back financially. I need to work for sure. But there's some people that are like, even if I was rich, I'd have to go to work. Like I have a job and like, not me. Like I love this lifestyle of just like getting up and just doing, doing what I want. And <laughs> what, what neighborhood did you land in out there? I'm in, um, historic Filipino town, but it's right by Echo Park. Oh, so it's a really side. nice it's area. Yeah. yeah. It's nice. Yeah. Echo Park. It's, like real it was, it was, downtown. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. listed, the apartment as Echo Park, but like three or four buildings before my building, there's like a historic mm-hmm. Filipino town. So I think it's technically that. Okay. Yeah, cool. Jeez, so so going back, I'm going to cut Scott off for a second. So one of the things that you were kind of saying when you were asking about like what kind of people, it, you brought up the fact that you, you know, have people who like with different types of jobs, different types of backgrounds, different kinds of things. And that's like the theme of your podcast, the failure to thriving theme isn't really like about, um, I don't know, like when it, 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 what I like about it is that it's just human conversation and about like Mm -hmm. things that went well and things that didn't go well and lessons you learned in your life and stuff like that. And I Mm -hmm. love the fact that you've talk to people and I've learned more about people I've known for a long time by listening to you have a conversation with them, um, which is just so cool. Um, (laughs) and, and so, I mean, I would hope, and I guess this is sort of, you know, just, uh, what I, as a listener of your podcast and a fan would like to see, I'm hoping you keep talking to people just because you know them, like even people like out in, in the, in the LA area, like just like, It doesn't matter. It's, you know, I worry, and this is, this is Midwestern guy with some minor LA prejudices coming in. And I'm admitting (laughs) that right up front. Mm -hmm. I've not always loved LA um, as a place, but part of it is because it feels like a lot of LA is on a hustle, you know, kind of like New York has the same thing. Like people go there Mm -hmm. to, to, to become and Mm -hmm. get it why they do it. It totally makes sense. That's where the people are. That's where the network is. But, um, I, you know, maybe I watched the movie swingers too many times. I don't know. Um, (laughs) but but I like the authenticity angle of the stuff that you do. I love the fact that it's like really just sort of an authentic human conversation between two people getting to know each other. I Mm -hmm. hope that remains your brand. Uh, it's not a brand. It's just legit. You know, I just, it was such a cool way to do a podcast. I'm sorry. I'm just a big fan of it like i was just like i like the fact that you didn't go and say oh i need a theme or i needed this or you're like i'm gonna talk about vulnerability and i'm gonna talk to other Mm -hmm. people about it and when there's not another person to talk about i'm gonna talk about it and i'm gonna make this into a strength and like 
that's just really cool. So oh, I just thank you. keep, keep yeah. doing that, I mean, please. That's my, that's my request. Has this kind yeah. of like humans of New York, like anyone qualifies because they're a human being and, mm-hmm. and like, there's not really a lot of that humanizing thing going on because they're usually topic based or sometimes yep. I feel like I can't interview certain people because they don't fit my extremely narrow niche of being an ex cult member musician or <laughs> author. <laughs> was, I was like, I've found 40 people on earth so far that could qualify. That's two seasons are possible. Then I have to quit. <laughs> no, yeah, but like, no, I mean, like it's my, humans yeah. of New York or, or the books by studs Turkle where he just goes, I don't know if you guys are familiar. That's a really old, that he was a writer back in the forties, but he used to go and just interview people like workers mm-hmm. in factories and just random kind of people. And then he brought that all together and was like sort of the voices of the common normal person. And it's yeah. really powerful. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, it's my, one of my favorite things I've ever done. And I, I think I just, I started it because I always, you know, I really liked podcasts and I was kind of was like, that'd be cool to, to do that maybe someday. And I, I just never, you know, I was too scared. And then, I, when I was planning on moving out here, I was just kind of looking to other options as far as like career wise and stuff. And I saw a producer at a podcast network position, which I obviously wasn't qualified for, but I just was kind of doing some research and they're like, I'm like, what do you even do to kind of get to get to that point? And one of the suggestions was to create your own podcast. And I kind of used that as an excuse because it was something I wanted to do anyways, but I was going to, I sort of downplayed it. Like, this is just me doing some career development sort of thing, you know? Mm. Um, but once I thought of an idea, I got really excited about it. And it's the like most consistent thing that I've been doing pretty much ever. Cause I'm definitely like some, uh, I have some ADHD intensely actually, not just some, but so I just, <laughs> I tend to get really obsessed with something and then move to a new thing like pretty fast. And so I've actually been actually been able to stick with this and, I don't know. It's something that I actually take kind of seriously now and it's really special to me. And I, uh, I don't know. It's probably the coolest thing for, for me personally, like most rewarding thing. One of the most rewarding things that I've ever done. For there's, sure. a, there's a lot to it, right? You have your show, you have your person, your relationship with that person. Then you're getting to know like audio and video editing. If you do video and you're more audio, mm-hmm. you're audio only at the moment, right? Yeah. I haven't done video yet. I thought about it, but I'm, I'm like, haven't dived in yet. <laughs> And you have your show art, but then there's like the video des- or like the show description, which is like unique to every show. So there's like a writing mm-hmm. element. And then there's the title, which is like, how clickbaity are we going to make this? Or like, mm-hmm. you can use data to inform it or can just be like really honest. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have uh, the show art, the particular episode art. So there's like, in the shows you have graphics. So there's like so many elements of creativity involved in creating a single episode. Mm-hmm. And I love all of those things so much. So like, I totally relate to like, I'm not as consistent as you are. You're already like way ahead in terms of once a week is, is like, that's when people hit success is when they're consistent with one once a week. I've read so many things are like, it's actually yeah. a really simple formula. Just keep doing mm-hmm. it and don't stop and do it on Fridays every week or whatever mm-hmm. the day is. Yeah. Are you getting your viewership or listenership? I guess it's listenership. Is your listenership growing? Um, <laughs> I mean, it depends. I'm anywhere between like my solo episodes definitely get like less traffic because I think the guest episodes, they share it, you know, and their friends will listen to that one. So the guest episodes get a little bit more. Um, but I'm anywhere between like 35 to 50 something, maybe 60 listeners per episode. Okay. So Cool. Not like it's pretty consistent, but it hasn't necessarily like shot through the roof or anything. <laughs> I listen to a lot of like, there's one so called how- grow the show. It's a, a show about making your show better. And so they talk about strategy. Mm-hmm. One of the, one of the big ones is like market your own product. So you, I don't think, do you have a product of any kind? You could be no. selling puff puff real hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Just sell old puff puff records. Danielle yeah. is the but, product. So, <laughs> yeah. One of the um, big things I've been doing is like an intro about this episode. So like you're basically making a promise with your audience in this episode, we cover topic one, two, three, four, and there's this incredible whatever thing. And then, then you launch into your little 30 second ad for whatever the thing is, or check out our whole show or check out this awesome series I'm doing side, side series, uh, whatever the thing, whatever, if you ever have one. 
and then you drop then the show is just like now you're delivering on your promise to your audience you might do an okay. outro ad because people just they're still mowing the lawn so like they'll mm-hmm. listen to your ad again <laughs> buy a buff record after they've heard about it seven times yeah <laughs> well i i i would like to figure out how to help more people hear your stuff honestly i think i think more people would enjoy it yeah we just got to come up with a with a danielle line of merch yeah <laughs> i know tasha reedman and i were talking about she's the one that did the um the cover art uh for the for the the, the podcast and so we had talked at one point about doing merch and like maybe doing a website and stuff. So I have I have lots of ideas. I just haven't really like pulled the trigger on any of them. And like I would Danielle really like to get a job. Yeah. <laughs> T-shirts. <laughs> I would like to get better at the social media stuff too. Like I I I do like a post every week for each new episode, but um I have ideas of kind of maybe making a little bit it a little bit tighter and stuff too, but um, it's one of those things that I just need to spend time doing because I do enjoy is- it. Like the, the, the least I can outsource to that stuff. Like I like, I like doing it. Like Cindy did the music and um, yeah, it's so did good. The artwork. I'm so impressed by the music. Yeah. That was, that was um, really cool that she did that. It's like a 25 second little bit and it's just like classically Cindy mm-hmm. and powerful and mm-hmm. on brand and hitting mm-hmm. the notes emotionally. And it's like, mm-hmm. she's this incredible wizard with it comes to songwriting little like choruses i know i asked her if she wanted to do it i was like hey i'm doing this and and this sort of about and i was like do you think you would maybe want to do my intro music and she was like sure and then like later she sent me like just her singing on her her phone like a little recording and i was like it's perfect and she was like any notes and i was like nope it's perfect and that's what it is (laughs) it's so good i think it's perfect too (laughs) That's what actually Valjo and I were talking about in a little YouTube short I did to preview that episode him and I did. Cause like mm-hmm. she's, he talked about working, writing songs with her and how awesome your intro is to your episode. It's like a little piece of our conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so for the people who are watching or listening to this, I know we haven't said it. We've said the title a couple times, but if they're like finding this all fascinating, they want to subscribe to failure to thriving. Is there anything in particular they should know about how to find it? I don't think we mentioned that um, yet. We've been talking about yeah. how great your podcast is, but we haven't talked about where it is. It is uh, pretty much everywhere. It's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, um, and a lot of those go out to the smaller ones. Uh, Stitcher is shutting down, I guess. It was on Stitcher, but I think it's shutting down at the end of this month, so no longer Stitcher. But uh, I think pretty much any kind of platform you use, you uh, can just search failure to thriving or Danielle Martin and it'll come up. Since we're talking about sort of how do we make a podcast and why on a podcast, which is fun, a little extra meta. What <laughs> is your aggregator? Do you use Buzzsprout? Do you use a different one? Podbean? There's all different ones, right? Libsyn? Um, I use Libsyn. Yeah. Libsyn. Do you like it? Mm-hmm. Is it working? I do. Yeah, it's cool. It gives me, it's like really easy, uh, especially once the, the setup is done. Like, it's real easy to set it, um, to post each episode and it gives me analytics, which I like. So. Do you ever use the record in their app audio capture? I never have. No. Okay. The, um, co-producer on witness underground coded all of it oh, as, cool. as a startup, um, after during the making of witness underground, he was working for the startup and then Libsyn acquired their company and everyone that was involved in, in the making of it got fired except for him. And so he's like the head of audio engineering at Libsyn. So if you ever okay. do use it, you're using like a Witness Underground producers. Like oh, cool. Software. That's very cool. It's very <laughs> yeah, cool. I guess I didn't even realize that they they have that in there. It's new. It came out this year in January okay. or last year in December. It's like a you don't need to have your own capture software. Like we're using Riverside right now. Mm-hmm. And it's just like still a trial, I guess. We're, we're five episodes in, but. It's, they all have different features and s- tools. Am I the only one who um, is a little annoyed by Stitcher going away? Because, I mean, um, it's... I, w- I only used that for a really long time until the, somehow something glitched and it erased everything I'd ever yeah. put in there or added. So I was like, well, there's a lot of other apps that work. <laughs> my, big, my, big, um, my big time that I was really heavy into podcast listening originally was like 
2005, 2006. I was like literally on the iPod, you know, down syncing the episodes down and the whole thing. And I even wrote an app called Sifter that was a podcast aggregation app in 2006 that I put out as shareware. Sifter. Yeah, it was. We talked about that on, on yeah. your episode with me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was my thing. But anyways, what's annoying to me is that like Stitcher got bought out by SiriusXM, and then they are trying to fold podcasting into their commercial radio platform. And I'm like, no, podcasting is the thing where anybody can make a file, put it on any server, and RSS feed it. Right. This is a very mm -hmm. democratic medium. And it's kind mm -hmm. of like, actually, it's kind of like Medium trying to take blogs and turn them into a paywall thing. Um, it's really annoying to me that SiriusXM did that for Stitcher. And I'm just going to go on the record, even if you're listening to this on SiriusXM right now, and oh. say unsubscribe <laughs> from those people. <laughs> do not buy their <laughs> products. Disassociate. From... Do not use <laughs> SiriusXM. They are fighting against DIY indie media. Mm -hmm. bad people so is that why stitcher is going away because sirius bought them and they're yeah. kind of like destroying uh -huh. the product I didn't exactly realize sense. Why. yeah yeah sirius bought okay. stitcher in about three years ago they paid 325 million dollars just to shut them down Whoa. so they want people to subscribe to their commercial satellite radio service in order to hear their mm -hmm. podcasts they're trying to get your work be their money and mm -hmm. that's just, I, I can't, I bought a car that came with three months of Stitcher or no, of uh, Sirius XM. And I never turned it on one time. I never like launched the app or played a single thing. And now they call me every three or four days and try to get me to like <laughs> renew. And I'm like, no, I never paid you. I'm never going to pay you. I don't want it. I don't mm -hmm. listen to your service. I hope you go to business. Then I hang up. On I it. think it's I really had good. it on mine too. And I just never, I, I didn't want to deal with it. Cause I was like, I just, I don't need to get into that. Cause I, I mostly listen to podcasts while I'm driving anyways and music at home. Uh, podcasts are, of... are democratic and terrestrial radio. And like, like our local radio K college radio or our local KFAI mm -hmm. fresh air, which my, my buddy Mason has been a DJ and he's a member of the staff there for years and years. Mm -hmm. Like that's good. Like, I don't, we don't need another serious, like making all the podcasts go through satellite services that you got to pay for, for a subscription that drives me nuts yeah. on the DIY yeah. indie conversation, which is relevant to both witness underground and your podcast and to my nuclear gopher baby, mm -hmm. because like, this is, this is the thing we kind of all have in common, right? Is we're all doing a yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. And that's something we haven't talked about. And I think you, you're not quite launched yet, right, Ryan? You have your YouTube channel, which has got, you're putting up the archival content, which is really cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, there's a big launch coming. The there's a big launch yeah, coming. Okay. The podcast YouTube channel, there's several records in the final stages of getting ready for being released. The big launch is coming. That's why I'm not talking about it yet, because I don't want to be like, oh, hey, go to nucleargopher. There's a friggin' placeholder image there right now. <laughs> Everything's behind the scenes. <laughs> right. You can't see anything. Okay. So this is so, the uh, post or during the crowdfund turn on. <laughs> is that the idea? October turn on? Yes. Yeah, we're going live in October. Nuclear Gopher's back okay. in October. I'll say that much. There's the yeah. Tease. Are you okay. doing um, a podcast, too? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yay. Want to be interviewed? Yes. I do. All right, let's do it. This is my first podcast that I've been on, by the way. That's not mine. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I've yeah. never been on a podcast before. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Well, speaking of like the podcast, we generally have a theme and format. It's been awesome talking about the, like, the, 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 the desire and structure of how you do yours. But you also have a history, and I know you haven't really talked about this much on your show, because at least the I've listened to like the first ten episodes, I think. Um, so there's more I've missed, but you have a connection to the ex witness, well, the witness world with through nuclear gopher mm -hmm. music, and then the Exodus and the post religion music. Can you tell us some of how you're related to that and how that was for you? Yeah, um, I guess most of the people, well, all of all of the people in your movie I've known since I was a teenager. And just 
same circle of friends. We were all really close. We all kind of found each other <clears throat> in that, I guess, time of our lives when we needed to connect with each other and because we were all Jehovah's Witnesses, but always, you know, like none of none of us went. Well, I didn't go to any of this, the same congregation as any anybody, but it was we def definitely didn't like have to stick to our congregation. I think it was encouraged, but like we all kind of at assemblies and conventions would meet each other. And that's kind of how you made your friends, because sometimes the people that you lived around weren't exactly who you vibed with, I guess. I don't know. So I just, uh, they were just all my friends and they were into the music scene. I was obsessed with music. I played the saxophone for a few years when I was in elementary school. Um, but alto. other than that, <laughs> yep. Alto. Me too. <laughs> and, uh, other than that, I hadn't really played anything. I'd always, um, been really interested in the drums. My dad had a drum set when I was little, but I wasn't allowed to touch it. Um, but I don't know. I just, I was into music. I was obsessed with just listening to music too. And I loved being around it. I loved going to live shows. And so I loved you, having what a you, circle. What hit you early? Like what music was like the early Dan, Daniel Martin music? Would um, you lay in your bedroom or whatever to hang out? Well, <laughs> like way back in the day, I was really into Ace of, Ace of Bass when I was like in elementary school <laughs> and like Voice to Men and Debbie Gibson and all that stuff. And then when I got to about like 12, I had an older sister who was like four years older than me. So that kind of helped. I got introduced to music that maybe the the kids in school weren't listening to. And that's kind of when um, it was early 90s. So it was one of the like sort of alternative rock kind of skyrocketed and everything. So um, I remember Nirvana and but I was really into Bjork actually when I was 12 still am Bjork's she's so like she's my amazing. favorite yeah. but I remember being 12 years old and being like she's my favorite <laughs> and so I maintained that I was the coolest 12 year old ever but um so yeah That's so right. it was music like that and then I think the first band that kind of um like overtook my everything and just was it was like my whole personality was the Smashing Pumpkins when I was about 15 I was Siamese Dream Siamese Dream and it was around the time actually um because I remembered Siamese Dream and I, re I remember hearing like those songs uh but when Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness came out was when I really started listening to everything and then I went in their back yeah. catalog and listened to Gish and Siamese Dream and um also Pisces Iscariot was out the their oh, yeah. B-Sides album and I loved that album too and yeah, yeah so I just some B-Side that came, I don't know if it was a box set, but there was this CD of like songs that they never made into full songs. It was like just riff after riff after riff. What did they do with it? Yeah, they're not talking here. about that. Instagram. The they're airplane. talking about the airplane flies high. Maybe, yeah. Can you find it? I was just, yeah, I just the airplane it flies Instagram. high. And I, I have a really copy. I have a copy over there too that I could go dig out. I, I'm I thought still about unpacking that record. things, so I don't know where. Oh, so, here it is. We used to listen to it while playing video games, and just put it. We'd turn off the video game console. <laughs> this music is the one you're talking about, right? repeat. <laughs> you know, um, I just need to hear one? it. I mean, okay. I want the whole world to hear this like, thing. Well, it's, it's like, like a five different albums in it. Disc set. Yeah, there's like yeah. five CDs in it that have like five songs uh, each on it. It's their singles and then like B sides on it. It's the B-side stuff Wait, blew my mind. Second. I absolutely loved it. We'd play, yeah. <laughs> we'd skip school, crank on that record, me and my cousins, <laughs> and and play Twisted Metal 1 and 2 on the PlayStation. Oh, and it would yeah. just be like, no one bother us. We are in zen state. Yeah, you also have it. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's got, yeah, like, to, it has a box. You, know. <laughs> you guys both have the actual box ready to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we didn't plan anything for this episode. This was not planned. <laughs> I just want to have one in the background since Danny's back. Yeah. <laughs> I, Part of um, your show decorations now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, um, I was homeschooled in high school. I went, mm. actually went up to sixth grade in elementary, uh, my elementary school went up to sixth grade. And so I did that in public school. And then I started homeschooling after that, which I didn't, uh, I am not pro homeschooling. I think it's different now because it's a little bit more like online and 
yeah. I don't know. Easier to connect. I'm saying like if people are into it now, yeah. But like at the time it wasn't community. and I just, yeah, it was not good for me because I just, I need that sort of uh, accountability, I guess. And so anyways, what I'm saying is I didn't do, I didn't do go to school. And so my everyday consisted of me starting off with Gish and I would just listen to the whole album and read the book. And then I go wow. to Siamese Dream and whole album and read the book and then Pisces Iscariot whole album <laughs> and then through wow. like everything up until they're current. I also have quite a few of the interview discs that are just him being interviewed basically like this. And so I would listen wow. to those every day too. I was obsessed. Yeah. So you were a fan. I painted. Yeah. I was a fan. Yeah. Actually, I made one <laughs> portrait that was super detailed and it was of the guitarist. No, that was Jamie. guitarist for Soundgarden. Mm -hmm different guitarists sorry total mind split <laughs> same era <laughs> yeah same era but, yeah yeah that's so instead of going to school you listened and read lyrics on repeat for breakfast yeah do you go to class after that or just like nah, no no yeah no oh, wow. it took me all day it was my daily thing because <laughs> 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 you're melancholy really well and educated in smashing pumpkins <laughs> yeah melancholy and infinite sadness was a double disc too with like 18 songs so it was a long day yeah. i still listen <laughs> I didn't to skip, lot, i actually. didn't skip anything either i didn't skip my favorites i just would go through all of them yeah so that's a really there, interesting history okay can i, can I riff on that can i riff on that a tiny bit um mm -hmm. i think that's an amazing experience that not enough people are having anymore because people don't listen to For whole sure. records as mm -hmm. a, as a unit, like right. it's too easy. So I think, I think I'm just, I'm just pointing that out. I don't know if I have anything to say about it other than that's a really wonderful thing to do. Like mm -hmm. I still love to just listen to whole records. Like I don't, I like I had a, a different, but similar morning routine. Um, when I was like 12 or 13, I started having to, or not having to, but I got a paper route because I wanted to be able to buy music gear and, and stuff. And I would get up in the morning and I would, I had like my, my stack of tapes, you know, and like, there was like the ones that were on steady repeat were dark side of the moon. Um, Peter Gabriel's album security that starts with rhythm of the heat and uh, talking heads, little creatures. And, nice. um, those three records, like I had the tapes and I'd put them in my Walkman and I would go out at four o'clock in the morning with my, or five o'clock in the morning with my dog and go to deliver the papers on my bike. And I would always like ride my bike to the top of the hill. And then I would turn on the beginning of rhythm of the heat and it would, you know, it, it just like, there was like a drum thing that like, is mm -hmm. in like every movie trailer ever that would come in just as I was hitting the bottom <laughs> of the hill going 25 miles an hour. And like. Mm -hmm. I had that that routine that for like a couple of hours in the morning, I'd listen to these records and I would dig the, you know, beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And it was just so great. It was so great. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I hope people still do that. Cause I love listening like to music. Shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love listening to music while riding bike. I, for a few years, I didn't have a car. And so I would take the bus or I'd uh, ride my bike everywhere it was probably kind of dangerous, but I would put my earbuds in because <laughs> I was like in the city too. It was probably dangerous, but there's something about it. And I also, I had a job where I worked at a uh, elementary school. Um, I did a before school and after school thing. So I started at like 6 a.m. And I would get all bundled up because it was winter. And I'd put my head, like my earphones in and I'd get on my bike and it'd be dark out still and it'd be awful at first, but then I'd be riding and a really good song would come on and it's like, you feel like you're in a movie. You're just like... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Soundtracking your day. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I love that. It's I, actually uh, one of the things I wrote a lot when I was first trying to pitch this project and actually it'll be coming out thing. I was like, get the soundtrack by high TV because... It's the soundtrack of my life. I listen to this now all the time. I edit with it like 20 hours a week for the last two years. I want you all to also have this amazing soundtrack to your life. Buy the soundtrack to your life. <laughs> it didn't, I don't think it landed with anybody, but it's a good idea. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it still can land. We haven't actually launched the soundtrack yet. That's true. Maybe we, we will in October. With a, Eric put together, Eric and put together a soundtrack to the series which is oh, right. all, most of it's from um, the RPM record that they did. Oh yeah. yeah it's the, not even available on Bandcamp, but the soundtrack is available on Bandcamp if you want to buy it. It goes to them, not me. Cool. 
Oh, I uh, think you were talking to her about, <laughs> you had asked me a question. I think I got distracted by the Smashing Pumpkin stuff, but <laughs> oh, about like post uh, Yeah, your history and music. My history yeah, with why, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, so um, I guess I was just around it a lot. And uh, Cindy and I were super tight. And so she would play with other people. So I was always kind of around her and she would, she, we lived together for a while. So it was kind of cool. Cause I'd come home and she'd just be playing and I, or I'd wake up and she'd be playing. I could hear it. And I was like, this is the best. Cause she's, she's one of my favorites, you know, not just cause she's my friend, but her voice is beautiful. Her lyrics are yeah. amazing. Her melodies mm-hmm. amazing. So I got, I got to be right in the middle of it all, which was super cool. Lived and in the then, studio. Yeah. Of the Wings Underground Rock yeah. Goddess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She'd be like, mm. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's so like humble and shy about it. It's cute. Um, yeah. But yeah, afterwards, I don't know if you would ask this, but like afterwards, uh, once once we left, uh, we were still, her and I, very close because we left uh, at the same time. And uh, we had moved, I had, we had both, we were both back in Minneapolis at that point And I moved into a new place with a couple guys who were in bands. And so our basement, they made into like a band room and my roommate Lucas had a drum set down there. And he said that if I wanted to, I could play it. And so Cindy and Eric and I were talking about Cindy and I doing a project together and Eric said he'd show me some stuff. So that was where Puff Puff started. Well, so you, you had, had you ever played drums before having that Just house rock drum band. set in the basement? We used to play when okay. we all lived in Seattle together. We had a rock band, and we were all so poor that we just stayed home all the time and played a rock band. And I was the designated <laughs> drummer in rock band. But. <laughs> and then when I've I was drunk, I would that. tell people I was a drummer. <laughs> oh, this is the manifestation thing. Like you say it enough times, yes. jokingly or not, <laughs> then you became a drummer. Yeah, but yeah, that was kind of how it how it started. Um, we just Cindy started writing something and. Eric showed me a beat that I should do. So and that was, that's and you where still I got it because I, you were, you were drumming with Puff Puff for what was supposed to be the witness underground film premiere concert. Yeah. And, uh, that didn't all wind up happening, but I got to hear you at practice the, the week, the Saturday before. And yeah, you guys sounded friggin' great. Yeah. That was so fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Should we do the same or just you? Because I didn't get that message. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. Hi. <laughs> Hello. I was just looking at this picture that um, is kind of cute. The one from the Puff Puff Facebook. It's your Puff Puff promo picture. (laughs) You look so shy in the middle there with the drums. So. Okay. Are you back? Looks good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, there was the, we we're talking about drums. Wait, Eric, so, you had an option to drum. Eric helped you with drumming. You started drumming and mm-hmm. then you guys did a project. Puff yes. Puff, right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can I just yeah, say, I, I love was, that um, you're right. drumming from rock band. I just wanted to say, I like, I love the idea that you, <laughs> you, you started off drumming on rock band and then it was like, Hey, yeah, I can do this. That's yeah. awesome. Well, Eric was very encouraging because he was like, you're good. Like, he's like, you got the be Like, you can do this. <laughs> um, so I've I always had... wondered if that could happen because mm-hmm. I grew up surrounded by instruments with my brothers and family and friends. And then, like, then the toys came out for rock band. Mm-hmm. And then people were, like, so into it, especially the first few years. It was, like, like a huge trend. And I was like, no, that's not, that's not the thing. Mm-hmm. What, what if people mm-hmm. only ever played the toy then what would they do? Like, how do you graduate from like the toy <laughs> to the real thing? And here we have an example of yeah. someone who did. And I absolutely well, love the drumming's your cool because you have. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not the same as drumming, but like you're at least getting some muscle memory of like because there's mm-hmm. even like a pedal and stuff, you know. So you get a little bit yeah. of it uh, with the drumming. The guitar, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but 
because <laughs> it's just a thing that you press. But um, yeah, I actually had the idea like w- like years and years ago with like no way to to make it happen. But I was like, what if you what if they made instruments that you could plug in and like w- like the, the the idea of like what you're playing showing up on the screen to know if you're in tune or not kind of thing. But it's like a real instrument that you're practicing on. I was thinking violin. That's why I was doing this because <laughs> I kind of want to learn how to play the violin. But and I, I feel like they've probably progressed and just like more stuff like that. I know there's things that at least can like listen and show you if you're in tune or not. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. a lot of that does exist, especially for like, are you in tune or not? That that's there's a ton of options there. It's a lot, lot of software there. But there's also a game. I don't know if everybody remembers this. But there was a game called Rocksmith that came out for the Xbox that. Um, let you actually plug a real guitar in and actually had you do like rock band type thing, but you played for real. And um, that was super cool. I remember using that and playing that and like, I would just plug in a guitar and like, you know, it starts off with really simple versions of the songs where you have like power chords or something, but then it like builds up and you get more advanced parts as you level up. And um, I wish it was more stuff like that. I haven't, I haven't thought about Rocksmith and, a long, long time, probably since I was on an Xbox 360, but um, yeah. it was really cool. And so you had good ideas there. Somebody else did do some of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, did you want me to check more about Puff Puff or? Yes. Just... Yeah. Yeah. It's an incredible record, and I wish I could have included some of that in the film. And there's obviously room for more people to make stuff and celebrate the mm-hmm. art of that time period, but. I listen to that record and every time I listen to it, I pick up my guitar and like play along. Mm-hmm. And it's not to say like the songs are simple, but like I, there's almost no music that makes me do that. I haven't played much music for like seven years. So mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh, I want to play along with this and sing it. It's like, so it's just, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So there's something there that really mm-hmm. is special for yeah. me at least. Yeah. And I guess I, I didn't really go in with like much expectations. I just thought, um, cause at first it was just going to be me and Cindy and Eric was there kind of helping me, but it was going to be like our girl band. And then my friend Tanya was over, Tanya Sturgis, and, um, she had never played bass either. And so Eric was like, we can teach you bass so you can be part of it too. So it was the three, of, it ended up being the three of us until, um, yeah. and we played live. Like that was the thing too, is Cindy was like, so, um, we're going to play, we, we we got like three or four songs and like Cindy's like, we're going to play a show. And I was like, what, what? <laughs> like, I thought we were just goofing around. <laughs> Cause that was just like the natural progression for her is like, we made music, we got to show it kind of thing. And then we had the chance to go mm-hmm. to a recording studio in Northfield, Minnesota with Michael Morris. And that was, that was so fun. We were there for the weekend. And I think that that's coming up on like 10 years ago that that happened, wow. but <clears throat> or it might even be 10 years. And that was where Puff Puff Give, the, the Give album, uh, our first one, mm-hmm. first EP came out and we did that. And and then we just, we played quite a few shows. I don't even remember how many, but we played the Midwest uh, Midwest Music Festival in Winona. That was cool. Cool. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then Tanya, Tanya moved to Portland for a while and so then eric just picked up the bass with her and so then it was eric and cindy and i uh for the remainder yeah and then we just kind of uh stopped playing at some point i don't know and we hadn't played for um but before tanya left i should say we recorded another ep in um at a studio in minneapolis i forget what it was called but it was really cool Uh, and that one's called echo which has got some great songs on it too and um, but what, yeah, we, what are your favorite songs from both of those? Um, <laughs> I don't remember. Let me look at it. I'm trying to remember what songs are on. <laughs> um, I guess we didn't sing them, but you had to learn the drums, right? I guess and there's always like, there's songs I love to listen to from my, like your, you know, your own work. And there's songs that were like super fun to play that maybe they didn't land as well in the audience, but they're like fun. Yeah. Um, oops. The, I'm sorry, I can't type and talk. Yeah, so on, um, on the Echo one, the "I Wish You a Good Luck" is one of my favorite ones to play. It's really great. 
Um, the song Echo, that's just Cindy, is beautiful. Like, I love that song. Um, and then I think Margot was the other one. That's all, that's all on the Echo one. And then on the Give album, it was... I think okay the give album which is the first one dream girl was really fun to play i'd always like get paranoid though because my arms would get really tired in it because <laughs> it's like a fast one <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um cool yeah and it was it was cool like i yeah. i don't um i always like kind of hesitate to call myself a drummer just because i wouldn't really like i know how to play that the pop pop songs but i don't know if i know how to play the drums really i'd get because i would very much just follow cindy like i knew how to play the songs with her because if she wasn't playing too i would always get kind of messed up like i followed her vocals more than anything which is probably not what you're supposed mm. to do as a drummer i don't know because i think you're supposed to be keeping time or something <laughs> in a way <laughs> <That's the idea>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that you sound confused about it. <laughs> it's beautiful. There's something about um, that relationship that you have with a person you're playing music with, though, mm -hmm. that I totally get what you're saying. Like, there's people when I was first learning to play guitar in a band in like a more structured way, like, we're going to learn this song, we're going to play it at the bar or at this show or whatever. We need to get tight, we're going to play it five times through, make sure everyone knows all the things. I'm following the guy who knows the song very, very well. Mm -hmm. whoever that is in that case it was a singer songwriter or singer guitarist and i'm basically just playing second guitar and then he can break into lead and i keep the rhythm going and it's i know the chord changes and i have my own little special thing i do but it's like i'm totally just waiting for the moments and i'm being cued by that one other person mm -hmm. it's not that i know the song that yeah. well i'm remembering mm -hmm. like based on the context of being with that other human being so i I yeah. relate to it in that sense. Yeah. Well, there and also, Daniel, if it I makes had, you feel yeah. any... Oh, I was just going to say, if it makes you feel any better, I played bass backing Cindy up several times over the years at lots of shows, too. And I just followed her lead, too. You were doing mm -hmm. the right thing. You know? You're doing the right thing. You don't have <laughs> to own and run the song just because you're behind the drums. Cindy's a force of nature up there. And, mm -hmm. you know, you did a... You know, supporting her is the right thing to do as a musician in that case. You, yeah. Even if you're hesitant yeah, so... to say you're a drummer, you're a drummer. <laughs> yeah. I'm it's not a so... drummer. I only made two albums. <laughs> it's kind of a funny thing to say. It's so fun. Like I, I love doing it. I've actually, I was looking into just the other day. Um, once I like get a job and stuff um, and have money coming in, I found a woman in town here who does drum lessons. And I was like, I just, I kind of want to do it just to get some, at least some of the, like the basic stuff down. Cause I, I, I don't know how to, I don't, I don't know any kind of basic things. I just, like I said, know how to play, but I would, I'd love to do it more eventually. Um, but yeah, we hadn't played together in a while. And then when the witness underground premiere was coming up and Cindy asked if we, if Puff Puff wanted to play, I was like super hesitant. Cause I was like, I don't want to embarrass myself. Like it's been years and I haven't been playing at all. And she was like, like not pushy, but like, like at all. She was like, okay. And she was like, well, do you want to just try? And I was like, yeah, let's, let's t like have one practice and just see, like, I can't commit yet. And then with, at, by the end of our, like our practice with um, Cindy and Eric and I, like, I was like, I think I can do this. Cause it was like, it's coming back to me. It's coming back to me. And so we practiced nice. for like, uh, I don't know, like a month maybe. And I felt like we were like once a week kind of thing. Yeah. Or? Yeah. And so we were, we were yeah. getting there and it was feeling, feeling really good. And I, I, I don't know. This is the first time I'd done it like completely sober too. And I just felt like way more <laughs> on it than I ever had yeah. before too. Like it was just really fun. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. It's you, part of me. Like, unfortunately the big, the big witness underground premiere in Minneapolis was, it was, it was already big and the film festival wanted to make it bigger by inviting all the bands to play. Mm -hmm. And that's like their whole thing at sound and scene music film plus music festival. And I was so excited that everyone was like making it all happen. And I was hearing all these whispers of like the best, like 
reunion show practices <laughs> hanging out again after a hiatus of a decade mm -hmm. and like everyone's having fun. I was like, yeah, that's awesome to hear. I can't wait for this day. And then we were like, well, if that's happening. Then like Ryan and I got together with like a director of lighting. So we had a lighting director and then he got like a person who does lighting tech to design lighting things for like every song for all the albums. And of course that we didn't have all the songs for all the albums. But I was giving them like your those records you mentioned, and I was giving them high TV stuff, and like here's the vibe, like work with it, and it'll be something like that or in that space. So she's like color schemes and different flows of lights, and like it was all like in the works. And since like I don't know, it didn't happen, but it would have been awesome to like just because I know you guys are having so much fun. I kept hearing it to have like recordings of just like you guys doing the practice and like have some like this is bringing back this like thing from the, the, you know, mm -hmm. the past that's everyone's having a great time with. Mm -hmm. Cause I love also the band practice before the show, you practice for 10 hours to play a 30 minute set, you know, mm -hmm. and the, those 10 hours are awesome. Hang out with your friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The day we were yeah, all there, I wish, that was, I wish that we would so have filmed it. Yeah. The day we were all there, I wish we would have filmed that like, cause afterwards we all went over to, uh cliff and norm's uh bar down the street and mm -hmm. we were all like this is the most amazing thing ever we're all together and we had so much fun and everybody sounds great and it's all awesome and, blah, 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 blah. and it was just like it was such a wonderful moment it was so great mm -hmm. it was so much yeah. fun and we all got to have that it's just too bad we didn't get to share it yeah yeah i have fomo <laughs> you guys are you're just fine. <laughs> well, sound on scene. For you, scene, the pop-up reunion happened. Sound on scene. <laughs> yeah. The sound on scene festival would have loved it too. It's too bad because we, we had the hook, yeah. hook and ladder was booked and it was going to mm -hmm. be a big. It was going to be fun, but we had fun, and you sounded great. Yeah, it was great. Do you think you'll ever do it? Do you think it'll happen again? Is that like a possible? God, do I a wish, show? wish we could. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd be, I'd be into, I mean, we don't you live in the same it. city anymore, but. Um, oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I moved away, but uh, I'm, I love Cindy and Eric. They're my best friends. So I'm always down to play with them again. If we ever get the chance. So. You gotta do a Minnesota once a month in the summer mm -hmm. tour pre mosquito season. Yeah. Come, back this, <laughs> come back to the city of lakes and do a puff puff reunion, mm -hmm. a couple bar shows or something. Yeah. yeah. Somebody booked that. Yeah. So what are your future plans now that you're in LA? Um, I need to get we, a I job. Know we talked about, you got to get a job. <laughs> yes. But, um, job, drum lessons, mm -hmm. meet some people. I um, yeah, I've met, um, so actually a couple years, almost two years ago, I was out just here visiting and Scott had the film. I can't remember where it was at, but there was, they were doing the film show. Fest. Yeah. Filmocracy Fest at mm -hmm. the brewery. Wasn't, it was a beautiful space for it. Not a great technically awesome space for it, but. It was a little hard um, to see yeah, on really like cool. the projector, but. Um, yeah. But yeah, I went to that because I, I saw that it, and I was in town. So I was like, messaged Scott and said I was coming to it and ended up. That's meeting, the first time we like, met, I believe. No, I'd met you before, but. Um, I did? Okay. Yeah, but it was, it was awesome that you came. I really appreciate it. Ago. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, I met like a group of people that we've been kind of keeping in touch through like a group text uh, that day. And so I actually met um, Bonnie for coffee a few weeks ago. And then oh, awesome. she invited so me cool. to her birthday last Thursday. And I went to dinner with her no and her way. friends and went roller skating. So um, <laughs> I love meeting, that so much. Yeah. So like meeting <laughs> some so people. That's so beautiful. And um, I actually signed up for a voiceover class <laughs> that starts in September cool. for wow. like four Wednesdays. That's cool. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. Um, it was kind of one of the things that I, I mean, like I said, when I come, came out here, I want to just be open to new opportunities and try new things. And it was always something I was sort of interested in, but didn't know what to do about it, especially at home. And then with the podcast and stuff, I thought like, I got a little bit more used to my voice too. So I'm feeling better about it. And so I figured it'd be just kind of a fun intro class to do. And then if, if nothing else, it'll help me maybe with my podcasting. So that starts uh, soonish. I think the first week in September. So next week, I guess. But yeah, 
should be a good time. <laughs> uh, what other plans do I have? I don't know. Um, kind of just hanging out. I'd like to, I guess, you know, make friends and hopefully find some people that I connect with. And yeah, I got my apartment. So that's one check down. <laughs> okay. You mentioned Bonnie. Bonnie Root is an mm -hmm. actress and writer. And I think, yeah, she also directs. She she made a, f a short film that she's actually turning into a feature now. Mm -hmm. So I she just had to catch up with her as well, which is so cool that you just met up with her in person. Yeah, she was telling me about call. it. It sounds really cool. So cool. Her film's called Sissy. It's on IMDb, and I believe you can stream it for like five bucks or something, but mm -hmm. it's very good. It's an all, it says a star cast. Um, I, it says Kristen Copen, James Duvall, Peter Giles. And those are, I recognize one of them. I'm not super, uh, but she knows she's very well connected and it's so cool. She's making that into a feature. It's about like, she's an ex witness as well. And it, her films about trauma and predators when it comes like sexual predators and like how, how they influence and get people to do things that they may almost make it seem like the victim. It was like the victim's idea. Mm -hmm. And her, her, her film is like, it's dark and beautifully written and beautifully acted. Like I was so impressed by it. So I'm so mm -hmm. excited for her to like, she's take, she's she, when we met her that day at the film festival, she was saying she has this film she wrote mm -hmm. and now she's actually like, she's brought the script to like the final stages. And so she's been talking to like big people about mm -hmm. funding it, doing it, acting in it. So things are coming together like maybe the next year or so for her. Yeah. But it's so cool. Like you have like a friendship with like <laughs> someone who's making these bigger plays, you know? Yeah. She's super cool. And she's been doing, I guess, a lot of voiceover acting as well. Kind of what she's been doing in the meantime, because of the strikes and stuff. Um, oh, yeah. And yeah, she's been very active with. Uh, yeah. So one of the friends SAG that was at her stuff. dinner was also a voice actor and they're the ones that told me about this studio that does classes. So that's kind of how I found out so about cool. this place. Yeah. So nice. I don't know. She's super sweet. And I actually talked to her about doing my podcast and she said she would, she's, uh, it'll probably be like a month or two, but, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, she's, nice. she's sweet. She, she's a great example of, of, you know, you were saying how you have a prejudice Ryan against people in LA or like LA culture or California culture. I grew up with a, a prejudice of some kind. Yeah, I mean, but. just for my in my in my very light defense. defense, I don't <laughs> yeah. hate LA culture and everything, and I don't blame people for going there. <laughs> I had some personal <laughs> unpleasant experiences my first few times I visited LA that made me not like the place very much, um, and they're totally subjective and it doesn't matter but like ultimately people you know i have a lot of friends who have gone out to la for different reasons and have love it there the weather's obviously beautiful i would come visit anybody if they asked me to um come visit you know, me but you want me in person <laughs> on your podcast Danny? um <laughs> so it's not that i just i kind of uh i think it it kind of like i'm comparing it to new york in a way there's been a history where like in order to succeed in the creative work world, mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. to go to these places and then that just changes the culture in ways that isn't always conducive to creativity. Like some of the great like yeah. creative scenes that have happened, uh, you know, happen in far away places or far away from the, the place where everybody's being sort of artificially magneted to, you know, there's like amazing music in, Omaha, Nebraska and in Seattle and then, you know, like, mm -hmm. and there's all these underground communities all over the place, Hanoi mixtape. Um, and so I, I, I just, uh, I have that sort of bias and I at least admit it's the bias, but if anybody from LA is listening other than your sports <laughs> teams, I'm not, I'm not upset. With you. <laughs> well, just to finish my thought. Thank you. Um, I feel similarly. <laughs> To some of those things. Um, Bonnie's a good example of someone who's like in the industry, been doing it for a, a while. It's like her whole career and also super humble and easy to talk to. And it's like, oh, you want to do voice acting? Cool. Yeah. I know some people. You should go to the thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's simple. It's like the 
Mm-hmm. Like I have, I always had this before I went there, this opinion that like people in LA are, I'm sure there are people that fit some stereotype that we might have about like gatekeeping or not giving you, you know, human respect. But mm-hmm. when you just have a normal human conversation, people are like, Oh yeah, you're cool. You're here for, to do work in a creative space. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. So like 4 million people, mm-hmm. like, there's classes. You can like join a thing. You can come to the community. Like there's a free thing on Wednesdays. Come over, mm-hmm. you know, I, that's, even that's the guy one thing invited that... me up to like his place in the Hollywood Hills to watch mm-hmm. movies. It's like, Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Some guy with a mansion, you know, yeah. that's one thing that was like struck me when I came to see your, your film and we were talking with everybody is that um, it's kind of, it's the cool thing about it is that every, almost everybody here is to do something like creative or at least try something, Mm -hmm. try something new. And so I, there's a very like open to it. And I didn't, it's not, there's, there's times at home and I'm not blaming anybody, but it's just um, like my own insecurity maybe where I was afraid to even say things that I might be thinking about doing because I was afraid of the reaction of, of anybody around me being like, you want to be a voice actor? You want to do this? Like, who do you think you are kind of thing? And here it's just like, oh, yeah. cool. I mean, even at like dinner, um, most of the people were actors and um, there was like a producer there. And <laughs> and I was just like sitting there and Bonnie told somebody that had a podcast and the guy next to me was super nice. He was a producer. He was telling somebody, he's like, Danielle does a podcast. And I was just like, they're just like very <laughs> much about like get like helping each other out and like, Mm-hmm. Show like showcase you, a and I'm just gonna like. To be said for that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. like, you have a podcast, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> What's it about? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so I definitely like need to build the confidence, but I do like that about here that I don't. It feels like everybody's kind of supportive <laughs> because everybody's trying to do something, maybe against the mm-hmm. grain. That's not like the normal like nuclear family, like buy a home work a job for 25 years, you know, kind of thing. And so, yeah, Yeah. because you're doing something different where maybe you'd feel like scoffed at by people at home. um, I I don't get that feeling out here because everyone's kind of putting their self out there in that sort of vulnerability of being doing something different and that might not work out, you know? So I like that about you. That's that's awesome. That that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and also I like that start. Yeah. I mean, like, everybody's got kind of imposter syndrome, right? Like what wh- about, mm-hmm. about what they're doing? Like you're, when Scott's asking you about your, your drumming on two albums and at all these shows and you're like, I'm not a drummer. I just played on rock band <laughs> and they made me do it on stage. You know, like it's, but it's, it's not because you aren't, it's because at least specifically in the Midwest where we all grew up, um, the, the, uh, idea of doing what you want to do and getting yourself out there and being like your own voice and all that is not greatly supported. So whatever self esteem Mm -hmm. issues you have, and every artist on earth has all of them, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it gets magnified and to go into any environment that says, yep, do that. Hey, we'll support you in that. And it like helps you with your imposter syndrome. It helps you with your self esteem, whatever that is very positive and I'm glad you're getting that experience out there. Like that, that is very cool because I, I, I think that's really necessary. You need permission, kind of psychological permission to do mm-hmm. some of these things or else you have to, I don't know, be in some crazy cult where you think the world's going to end. So it doesn't really matter if you do this or whatever, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> but if without the psychological permission, like you don't, you don't get it. So the, like, that's just mm-hmm. validating. Yeah, and like, like you're you're not yeah. an imposter. You're you're like a professional. You're doing this. You got this. You know. Thanks. Yeah, you're doing I mean, better than me. It's, it's <laughs> definitely like a real thing. Like, man, but you have to get like you have to give yourself permission first. I think because I think a yeah. lot of us just don't. And then, but it does. It helps more when you have it from that kind of support from people around you. And you were saying about the Midwest thing, and I think we all like we have that definitely. But then on top of it, we have. A, a, an upbringing where we weren't supposed to want anything that like was, you know, besides getting a wage that we could go out and service, you know? So yeah. um, any kind of dream, like fantasy thing that we had was just always very like hushed up because you couldn't even say that you wanted that because it was like, you can't do that and be a witness, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So fighting, There's something fighting I think that. makes this all into a great segue for the thing that we thought we were planning to talk about, which is our big push and launch for Witness Underground, the release of the film. Um, in October, we're going to do a big crowdfund. And the guy that we're working with, we partner with, his, he has two companies or projects. One's called the Kickstarter guy. He's like a professional Kickstarter fundraiser. And the other one is called Greenlight Yourself. And that one always resonated with me. And his whole concept is like, he, he was on a TV show. He's an actor, had a really great start to his career. And then it got canceled and he was just like left with nothing. But he had been writing and he did the script and his friends like they co-wrote the script and so they decided to crowdfund it. And then he created this whole concept of like, like that worked and they made their first movie and, but he had pitched it to like 20 different studios or, you know, whatever the thing was and everyone had rejected it. He's like, green light yourself is, is like the concept. And I kind of, we're kind of talking about that, like give yourself permission. And then if you, you know, someone, you can just do it, but if you want to like do something bigger, you can crowdfund it. And so we're doing that. Um, that's how I got this. That's how I got Windows Underground started, and that's how we're going to wrap up the final celebration, which is like, yeah, it's, just a, it's a long time coming, but it's it's a way to, what, and I think the offer is to everyone who wants to get involved in that, is that we should all know how to do it. And so by helping us do it, becoming someone who's involved in the crowdfund mm-hmm. on some level as a team member, you're going to learn how to do it. So the pitch is you get this education so that if you need $2,000 to do something, you can probably do it yourself. But if you want to like actually fund the movie or fund the album or fund the book or pre-sell something that's like your creative genius that you're excited to create, or even just do a big marketing push, like this is, we're all going to learn how to do it so that we all have the tools to then do it next year for the next project or for the next friend of ours. Um, so yeah. become a core team member, anyone who's listening to this and also Danielle. <laughs> very cool and the idea is like green we should all green light each other right like mm-hmm. let's help support the self-realization of our creative imagination anytime we have one witness underground was mine five years seven years ago what's yeah. the next one <laughs> nuclear gopher uh launch reboot nuclear and gopher the daniel martin season two of failure to thriving <laughs> year two season two You're doing seasons or years um, or weeks <laughs> well it's been i guess in october i started it last september so it's, i've been doing it almost a year but the first episode came oh, out wow. in october so um i'm coming up on the year mark yeah okay so when we interview you on our crowdfund we're going to do the one year celebration of failure to thriving yes one year anniversary yay <laughs> cool tomorrow will be episode 42 so getting up there too oh, that's a big wise. one yeah <laughs> so so scott is that and how I, old you are or is that the answer to the universe and everything <laughs> it's not how old Life. i actually my birthday is in like a, a little less than two weeks and i will be 41 so uh okay nice i realized i put 42 <laughs> songs in the soundtrack because of arthur dent and i'm also 42 and so to have my movie come out in the year my birth year or 42nd year <laughs> at all like it maybe it all makes sense that this is the timing <laughs> I, I resonate strongly with all of that thinking i'm also a big hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy fan also love all six books in the trilogy 42 is a very important year um <laughs> I'm not going to say how long ago it was, but it was a very important year. Uh, <laughs> so, so there was kind of a hidden, well, not very hidden, but slightly hidden thing in there, Danielle, which is we do uh, want to have a conversation with you about you kind of being one of our core team member people. We can edit this out of this conversation if we want to, when you post this, Scott, but we do okay. actually want to, uh, we were going through and thinking like people that like could get included on the, the training s- s- modules and actually help us in October. Yeah. And we were discussing you as like somebody who we'd want to ask if you would want to participate in a sort of committed stake thing for the length of the Kickstarter. Well, we and, like actually in advance of the Kickstarter in September, mm-hmm. we're going to be like prepping and, and getting lists together and, you know, watching mm-hmm. modules and having meetings and stuff. But the goal is to okay. raise that money for the Witness Underground launch, but also 
to cross promote each other right so if you didn't read it as a direct um a direct ask uh you just thought it was kind of like a thing we're doing we actually do want to directly ask you if you want to participate and if you don't it changes nothing we're all still loving your friend loving you and you're still our friends but um <laughs> just think it would be it'd be cool to have you like help with the, the core team yeah so i'm definitely into the idea it. what kind of um what it just kind of depends on like the time commitment and what, uh, mm -hmm. cause I'm looking for work and I don't know what that's exactly going to look like, but, um, I, I'm definitely interested, especially if like, once we get the details and out, if I think I can pull it off, I'd love to help. The general work of it is going through all of your contacts you've ever made in your life, because the ultimate goal is like, is just reach. Because five percent of people that see the message will fund it because they're like, "Oh, that's super cool." Oh, like I haven't mm -hmm. I haven't heard from Danielle in years, and she's doing a cool little thing. That's that's great. Mm -hmm. Let me check it out. And then they like happen to buy your record, or they buy like Brian's record, or they mm -hmm. like the movie and they want to watch it, or a t shirt or something. Mm -hmm. The Danielle needs a job t shirt, <laughs> and and it's like Justin said, it's kind of a cool excuse to um, just reach out to people. You don't, it doesn't even need to be like a, a obvious ask. Like you're not saying like desperately like, we need money for this or like we're gonna fail. It's like hey, check out this cool thing. Check out all this cool stuff that me and my community have made in support. So it's gonna be books, it's gonna be CDs, it's gonna be all this other stuff related to nuclear gopher, Windows Underground, books, James's book, other books. Um, could be T-shirts for YouTube channels. Could be a T-shirt for your show. We can promote your show. And that's kind of what I'm offering is like you get the education on how to do it. But ultimately it's like, here's all the people that I've, I've have their email and I don't really know who they are. Like the gas station attendant gave me his card and I emailed him for some reason 10 years ago. Yeah. He's an acquaintance. He'll get the newsletter. And then there's the personal ones and you're like, okay, so these 100 people, I know who all of them are. I haven't talked to this person in seven years, but if I, I'm going to write them, I'm going to use the, we're going to have like an organized form letter, but you're going to personalize it. Like, Hey, it's a great excuse to reach out to you. I'm working on this cool thing. How are you? Mm -hmm. you know, like, and we're really up. sensitive to not having it be like multi-level marketing and you're like being asked to ask people to do something or to give money. Yeah. It's more mm -hmm. like soft, a very like more like take advantage of the fact that a lot of people co co collectively will have any one individual only has so many actual close connections and there's going to be people that, you're very close to that you wouldn't even feel comfortable telling them that they're that you're participating in a Kickstarter because you don't want to hurt a relationship that they go on mm -hmm. like a do not contact list. But the idea is to help aggregate build kind of a, a, a broad array of um, connections. And then the vast majority of people are going to totally ignore the message mm -hmm. and a small number of people and often people you don't expect um, will uh, will think, oh, that resonates. That's something I'm interested in. And so the method is to try real hard not to like make people feel like you're selling them things and not spam them and whatever. But mm -hmm. like, there's a there's a little bit of a method to it, just to to try to like multiply the number of eyeballs who will get aware of the thing. And then mm -hmm. if enough eyeballs get aware of the thing, then statistics kind of come to your aid and people will want to help out on some level. And mm -hmm. so we're, we're not like, I just, I don't ever want to feel like, you know, kind of skeevy about like sending out contacts to like every rando person. But like, there's a lot of people who have networked up with me on LinkedIn because I'm in the tech industry. They're in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. I will tell all of them about this thing and I won't mm -hmm. worry. Right. Because gonna, most yeah. of them aren't going to give a shit. They're just going to delete it mm -hmm. and it's fine. But a few of them are going to go, oh, that's cool. I don't know what that is. I barely remember Ryan Sutter, but oh, wow, I'm interested in this. So that's kind mm -hmm. of the approach. Is it strictly email or is there like a social media component? Because I'm going to be honest, like I'm, I'm trying to think of even whose email I have in the it's not many, but I have like mm -hmm. more of my interaction is um, through like my Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. Yeah, Not just, Twitter so much, but I haven't gotten, I haven't gotten into the what exactly we're posting and where yet because it's mm -hmm. part of the training. Okay. Right now we're in the direct contacts via email is like you own that audience because they're your personal contacts. So okay. it's like that's prime and that's where mm -hmm. most of the um, benefit comes. Um, when it comes to social media, there's another 
angle to this, which is we're going to try to get what they call, there's a core team, which is what we're talking about, and there's a street team, which is the other category. And the street team are people that will like and comment on anything that we do post on social media. Mm-hmm. And that is like the 45 second, like I'll do that. I'll do something for 45 seconds every day for a month for, for the Witness Underground project. Mm-hmm. Um, echo chamber, that, basically. The hacks, <laughs> yeah. hacks the algorithm. Mm-hmm. What'd you say? I said echo chamber. Yeah. Yeah. It's like- it hacks the algorithm and it like the, then the software will just like boost it for you for free. And we might even pay some like little ads that also move those same pieces of content we're going to create. But, okay. um, so those are two options. The core team is like, you get to learn the training and the street team is like, please comment and like on things when we ask cool. you to. Yeah. Okay. So then we're yeah, going to invite good. you to meetings about it cool. and you'll okay. see, we'll, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. But like, yeah. we're trying to, we're trying to get like, we got, me and Scott, Anthony Mathenia, uh, we just talked My to... My friend Rue Ru from Wisconsin. She's in up Marquette, Michigan. And then, yeah, we're going to try to find a few more folks. Where the goal is to get, like, I don't know, six to eight people oh. who are all going to do something. David gave a pretty pretty solid, like, he gave an Anthony Mathenia style yes to it. Okay. okay. He said almost the same thing. He's like, well, I've tried crowdfunding before, tried to sell my record, and he's like... It just kind of falls flat. It's so hard to sell something for 10 bucks. But that's because, and Anthony said something similar, right? But it's like, this is the thing that's different about this course is that it's make a team, make a big team so that your reach is way bigger than your own personal reach. And then don't try to necessarily pitch hard to yeah. that. Just go for, you know, coverage the numbers game. and mm-hmm. yeah. and and also res- like make it respectful and make sure that it's just more of a it's more of like a connection thing and awareness thing i, th- I thought yeah. it sounded really cool and i think it could work i think it is a chance to raise between 20 and forty thousand dollars to help launch the movie which would be pretty awesome um yeah. and possibly push you up to you know 70 viewers per episode or listeners <laughs> per episode <laughs> no, I think seven hundred. I think thirty five, thirty five thousand. <laughs> yeah, let's manifest thirty five thousand listeners. I want to see thirty five thousand <laughs> listeners. I want to like be like I knew her. I when. can already see it. It's happening. It already <laughs> happened somewhere in the mm-hmm. multiverse. So nice. just bring it into our version. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a digression, but oh. I just wanted to make sure we we like had that. Yeah, no, I'm glad you explained it a little bit more. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm, you said like, the commit. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, he said the time commitment is something between, like, if you're doing it casually or you're just really efficient, it could be like 20 hours of September. And if you're really, like, detail oriented and you're really, like, putting in the time or, I don't know, slower, like, probably me, he says, like, more like 40 hours. So 20 to 40 hours, depending on, like, how much of the effort you put in. Not per and week. Then it's like one hour, a, one hour, a, yeah, total yeah, just over for the, the month. month. Yeah. Like prep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The prep time for the campaign. Mm hmm. Um, and it could be like the next spot. We're thinking about the second week of October. Um, so it's, it's five weeks. And so over that time, and then it's one hour a day for 30 days, which is like, you already pre-wrote all these emails, but then you need to go like personalize them and send them. And then he's like half of the first week stuff is just like people saying like, Oh my God, Danielle, like I haven't talked to you in forever. Well, how are you? And then it's like, well, I'm in LA and I'm having an awesome time meeting actors. Mm-hmm. And you have these like back and forth conversations. Mm-hmm. He's like, that's the first week of work is like saying hi to all your friends you haven't talked to for a long time. It's like, he's like, it's kind of a cool thing in a way. Cause like how often do you write to all, everyone you've ever met in mm-hmm. a really short period of time? And it's like an excuse to do so, mm-hmm. which make me feel like it's a, it's not such a daunting task. Cause I'm like, yeah, I mean, I do want to talk to all of my friends. They're in different countries and States, but like, We'll make that happen. Yeah. yeah. But do all my friends want to talk to me is the thing I worry about, but that's a whole separate <laughs> thing. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> if I start yeah. getting a lot of emails back that, that begin with you bastard, I'm, I'm going to come talking to you, Scott, about this. <laughs> you owe me money. Yeah, yeah. You can throw me under the bus. <laughs> it's, this is Scott's project. <laughs> I still think I, I still did, never got over the you bastard email I got from Danielle that one time, but you know, I, it's okay. I forgive you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it was the heat of the moment. <laughs> <laughs> you probably never called somebody a bastard to their face in your life. Uh, I've called somebody an asshole to their, to their face. It's pretty close. A couple of times. 
And there's been a few go fuck oh, yourselves yeah. too. So <laughs> <laughs> there's your starter clip right there. You just start from me making the comments about the bastard and, and, and Danny ending up with, there's a few go fuck yourselves. Leveling and they up. say, now today, Danielle Martin <laughs> on Linda's Underground. Failure to thrive. That's a fun. That's a fun ad for your show. Yeah, I'll start running the, the ad that ad for your show on my show. Yeah, sounds love good. Love it. <laughs> love it. <laughs> Scott, well, I gotta wrap here um, pretty soon because of yeah. dog things. Sounds um, good. Danielle, anything you want to say? Or I can do a little quick thank you and the show proper outro thing. Sure. Yeah. I mean, thanks for having me. This was really fun. It was nice to catch up with you guys too. Even if it wasn't recorded, this was fun. <laughs> Yeah, it was awesome having you. Really appreciate it. I, I love yeah. the the dive into the your story. I'm sure there's a lot more to say, but and I we'll love get that it through listening we got to, your show to be we'll your first. Again. I love that we got to be your first uh, podcast as a yeah. guest. Mm-hmm. Um, we're honored to have had you. It's been great. Thanks again, everybody. Go listen yeah. to Failure to Thriving. <laughs> Failure to Thriving and Puff Puff. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks again. I'll see you next time.